On February the 4th, 2011, the House of Literature in Oslo welcomed the British author and journalist Nicholas Jackson for the launch of his new book on tax havens. We talked with Jackson before the launch and the following debate meeting to hear more about how tax havens function and why this is an important issue. The, the book that I have written has looked at the offshore system and found that uh, it's, it's much bigger than most people realise. And it's very much the product of uh, people in rich OECD countries setting up structures. It's not just a bunch of people sitting out on islands, uh, uh, which is the stereotype. One of the arguments in my business, in my book, is that uh, what is legal is not necessarily what's right. Uh, and that's one of the key themes that goes through my book. So I have a big problem with a lot of the activity that is, they will turn around and say, but we're not breaking the law. And I say, yes, but you're abusing the citizens of... Uh, of, of whatever country shifting the tax burden onto them. There's a widespread perception that these are just kind of atomized sovereign states behaving on their own. Uh, I think mo most people assume that and they assume it's very difficult to crack down. But if you actually look at what the tax havens are, where they are, you'll discover that half of the whole global offshore system is British. Uh, so it's not so. This is a system where just a few, a small number of countries have an enormous influence on the whole system. It's not a bunch of isolated, separate sovereign states all doing their own thing. What has happened over the last decades, nobody has really noticed the offshore system. It has been invisible. It has just, you know, people have kind of known that there's things out there. They've seen it as a sort of exotic sideshow to the global economy and said, well, you know, that's just some bad people doing bad things. Nobody's really noticed this thing developing to the, to the size it is. Um, and I think we are just in a phase now of waking up to what this thing is. I think, you know, my book is one part of that, that, you know, organizations, non-governmental organizations, um, particularly in Europe at the moment, uh, and Publish What You Pay has been incredibly influential in pushing this forward and has, has had tremendous success. The term tax haven is a bit of a misnomer because uh, it makes people think that this is only about tax. Now, tax is obviously an important part of tax haven activity, but probably, possibly more fundamental to the whole issue is secrecy. Wealthy elites in developing countries, and particularly ruling elites, will take their money offshore, stash it away secretly, that income is lost. There are all sorts of numbers associated with this. This month, um, Global Financial Integrity released new, uh, new research showing that in 2008 about 1.25 trillion US dollars uh, in gross illicit financial flows flowed out of developing countries. This is trillion, not billion. This is absolutely huge sums of money. We're seeing OECD countries themselves as huge recipients um, by adopting tax haven characteristics, sucking up this money there, using their own secrecy to prevent the governments of developing countries and, and other countries from obtaining the information they need to tax their citizens. One gets the impression that um, the tax treaty is based on the OECD model, deprives the developing countries of the right to tax the profits from, the, from, the comp from uh, business carried on in that, in that uh, country, either through subsidiaries or branches. But that's not correct. The, 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 the OECD model gives the right to tax the business to the country where the business is carried on. Okay, I think, um, no, I mean, I think there's probably a valid point there. The, I think an interesting way of looking at it, though, is looking at, the, you know, there's an OECD model and, an, and a United Nations model. The question is which country gets to receive which share of the income and where is the balance? And, and um, I, I don't think I gave the impression that uh, developing countries lose, lose everything. I think my impression was that the balance was... Uh, was unfairly tilted towards, towards the home country. Uh, but even that, I think, is questionable because the right to tax the profits of the business is with the country in which the, the business is carried on. Did I give that impression in the book that they actually... I, I mean, I, my point was really about balance, about balance between... Yeah, but, but what's, yeah, what's imbalanced in this? I mean, the, 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 the right to tax the profits is with the developing country. What's unbalanced on that? On that? Well, there are, because there, are, you know, there's the there's the the, the home the, the home jurisdiction will also make uh, will make it. Uh, no, they are not. They, they, well, they have, they have to give credits for the taxes in the developing country or exempt the income. But the credit, the credits, uh, withholding taxes will be sometimes capped. They will sometimes yeah. be reduced. Um, yes, yeah, so withholding and taxes is another issue. That's yeah, the taxation okay. of the shareholders. <clears throat>
Okay, yeah, I, I think, think uh, okay. we uh, keep on. Okay, next. Okay. Yeah, Good, so, uh, difficult question, that one. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> there are these efficiency arguments being made. And uh, another of the uh, problems with the efficiency arguments um, is, you know, if you make the flow of money more efficient, that will allow more money, more capital to flow into developing countries where it's badly needed. But what we have seen instead, when you make this flow more efficient, the money in, on a net basis doesn't flow in, it flows out. I mean, there has been some money flowing in, clearly, but the, the amounts flowing out through the same channels are much, much, much greater. And so you have this whole global financial secrecy space uh, that has been created, and the net flows are going to flow just one way, from developing countries to developed countries and into tax havens and into OECD countries, which are tax havens. So it begins to look very ugly indeed, what's, what's going on here. I have no problem with people taking their money to another country. But the things that tax havens provide secrecy, particularly, plays no role at all in this. So people can take their money overseas, but we don't need tax havens for that. We can just have a properly transparent financial system. Uh, and what is your perspective then on, on the future? Is it really possible to introduce uh, better leg uh, legislation and, and um, to um, get rid of all, all the problems with the tax havens? You're quite right, countries can put in place defences against tax haven activity, no question about it. What will then happen is once a new legislation comes in, you will have out in the tax havens or in the city of London or wherever, there will be teams of people meeting saying, right, well, there's this new piece of legislation and let's, uh, let's find a way around that. Generally developing countries um, will find it much harder to put in place these defences, so these new kind of offshore loopholes and opportunities keep popping up all the time and it's much harder for developing countries to put in place these defences. One of the, you asked about the future, one of the interesting ideas that has been floated that has got a few people quite excited is, is a notion, um, I know that John Christensen, the Tax Justice Network was talking about, it was an organisation floating the idea of an organisation tax inspectors sans frontières, so you would have, uh, you know, instead of doctors going into developing countries, you'd have tax inspectors, and I think they uh, could be incredibly powerful as a, as a, as a, as a way forward for, for developing countries. What I've seen is um, a, a large development to give the appearance of action. Um, the most dramatic example of this is in the area of international financial transparency and secrecy. The OECD set up a kind of black, white and grey list of tax havens. Not many people noticed, but the, uh, the black list that the OECD had was empty within five days of that announcement being made of bank secrecy is, is, is dead. So this is, uh, that was a signal that things are not, perhaps not serious. You know, it's civil society that is that is pushing this process is not governments really. Governments are kind of being pushed. Some governments are, are more willing to look at this stuff than others, but, but the Norwegian government can play a huge role, has played a huge role, and I, I think can really take a lead on creating new initiatives at an, at, at an international level. In, in Britain, my country, the, uh, the government is saying the only way forward is to, is to have large spending cuts, and people are uh, very unhappy about that. But there are people now saying, well, there is this alternative, there is an alternative to spending cuts, and that's to crack down much more strongly on both tax evasion, which is the technique, which is by definition illegal, but also tax avoidance. Um, um, there was quite a small laugh uh, when people heard about uh, tax auditors sans frontières, but that actually <laughs> is a good idea. The capacity and, the, and how capable the various countries are to enforce the laws is probably one of the major problems. We can establish as many agreements as we want if we can't enforce them on both sides. Right, yes. yes. That is undoubtedly a, ver a very big problem, um, undoubtedly. And it, it, and it is, in fact, a problem that face it faces campaigners at the moment because the, the governments, so the, the rulers of these developing countries, don't want to get transparency because they're at it themselves. It's a, it's a very difficult problem. There's a problem of legitimacy for people like the Tax Justice Network uh, calling for this stuff, which is clearly for needed for populations. But when the rulers of these countries don't, want it because they are themselves are using the, 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 the offshore system, 
then we have a real a real problem. I think you know that we're still in an early phase of education of understanding the offshore system, a very early phase of seeing what's actually happening there. People, most people assume this is some sort of exotic sideshow and have not paid attention to it. I think once this becomes much more mainstream in the development discourse, then I think we'll start to see these calls happening. But I suppose the simplest conclusion is that uh, tax havens and offshore activity is at the end of the day harmful. Uh, there are various perceived benefits that are the defenders of offshore make various arguments in their defence such as it makes financial capital flow more efficiently around the world. My argument is that the range of harms that are caused by all of this are far, far, far greater. This stuff is bad for your health, it's bad for your economy, it's bad for particularly poor and middle classes and it enables wealthy sections of society to shift whatever burdens they don't like, taxes, rules, laws off their backs and shift them off onto everybody else. So we have to pay the taxes that they don't want to pay.